Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank the organizers for this wonderful opportunity, uh, both the uh, program, workshop, and, and this conference are just fantastic. Um, so today I'll discuss with you the monoclinic nanocolloidal nematics and topology uh, as we use them to design and realize new types of matter. Uh, I would like to start from acknowledging my students and postdocs, and in particular, Jason Wu, who is uh, here uh, in audience with us as well. Uh, I'm also recruiting new postdocs for the group, um, and um, for that reason, I guess it's good to show a little bit of what different research directions we have in our group in, in relation to colloids and nanocolloids in particular. Uh, we exploit the uh, topology, uh, light powered um, <coughs> motors and self-assembly uh, matter in outer equilibrium, including realization of different types of adaptive crystals and giant electrostriction switching of different um, types, of, types of plasmonic nanocolloidal assemblies, uh, as you can see in here. And in some cases, we not only do highly fundamental research, but also uh, research that uh, has its potential for technological applications, where we can prepare samples at really um, applications relevant scales, such as uh, um, a smart windows, for example. And uh, um, some of our postdocs, as well as students, actually receive royalties for technologies that have been licensed to industrial partners. But today I'll focus on highly fundamental research component, where we will start from designing colloidal nanoparticles that have certain uh, properties in terms of self-assembly and interactions from these particles will um, realize new types of condensed matter systems where uh, fluidity and order are combined in a very different way than in systems demonstrated so far. Then we will use uh, the topology and chirality in order to re realize super particles in the form of topological solitons that are mimics of nuclei of uh, atoms or subatomic particles with different baryon numbers. And then we will see that these super particles can also self-assemble into different crystalline arrays, like the ones you can see in here, which also are highly adaptive and responsive to external fields. In our research that I'll discuss with you today, the host medium is not water or isotropic fluid, but uh, an emetic liquid crystal fluid that is made of these nanometer long molecules with average orientation in here shown with a uh, director with head tail symmetry. And uh, from the standpoint of view of physics we'll discuss, we can understand this type of assembly as a molecular alignment field, which will be perturbed when we will incorporate nanoparticles into such a fluid. Moreover, we can control how these molecular alignments are deformed by defining the surface boundary conditions, which, by the way, often is done with the help of ligands, similar to the ones many people use in this community. And then we can define the deformations around such a colloidal particle where molecules and liquid crystal director have to meet the far field uniform alignment, but also comply with the boundary conditions on the surface. And the way they do it is represented by minimization of uh, elastic free energy. So in here, although this is a fluid, but we do have orientational elasticity of liquid crystal, and deforming the director away from the uniform alignment cost energy, which is described in the simplest form with this free energy functional, which if you minimize, you obtain Laplace-like equation, and then the solutions for the energy minimizing director 
can be represented in terms of multiples or 2L poles. Moreover, if we look at this particular director deformations around this colloidal particle with conical degenerate boundary conditions, uh, for certain cone angle, what we realize is nothing else but a hexadecapole, um, where this representation is very similar to what a hexadecapole would look like in electrostatic charge distributions, where in that case we would represent positive and negative charges, but in here we have these deformations of the director field that is tilting to the, to the right or to the left and has negative or positive components of say X component of director field. But representation in terms of spherical harmonics and in terms of um, <clears throat> Legendre polynomials uh, is very similar to that in electrostatics. Moreover, by controlling these boundary conditions, we can realize different types of multiples from monopoles to hexadecapoles, octopoles, and so on. Uh, and uh, as we know very well, um, the electron shells and wave functions are also described in terms of spherical harmonics. So uh, the, um, <clears throat> all the chemical elements that have been found so far uh, are filling in this row in here, and the last element is 118, uh, which is still in the ground state with the field F orbital. It would be only in the next row of the elements that we would have G orbital orbitals filled in the ground state. And actually, the hexadecapole that we have been looking at is uh, such a uh, colloidal atom um, in terms of spherical harmonics description that we would have uh, in the next row of the chemical elements in this periodic table. But it's not only in terms of the description that we uh, have this analogy, also uh, the electrostatic analogy would imply that we have certain uh, uh, pair interactions described, for example, uh, by this pair interaction potential uh, in terms of the Legendre polynomial in here. Um, and indeed, as we probe such interactions with the help of laser tweezers, we can find, uh, for example, in this case, as you can see, the angular sectors of attraction and repulsion, exactly as prediction um, <clears throat> by this nematostatic analogy with electrostatics would imply. Moreover, we can also characterize pair interaction potentials, uh, and again, we see a very good agreement with this type of theoretical description. So it's very good because uh, we have a very simple way of designing colloidal assembly. And with that, for example, we can realize very low symmetry triclinic colloidal crystals, as in this case formed by um, uh, electrostatically charged nanorods in pneumatic host medium. Uh, and uh, however, my goal today is to do something beyond what is possible, because all of these crystals we know um, exist in nature and they are limited in number of different crystal symmetries that you can have because uh, the symmetry of the bases and the crystalline lattice, lattice have to be compatible. No such restrictions exist when it comes to pneumatic liquid crystal fluids with an inhibited fluidity. And so potentially we can realize even much larger variety of different types of symmetries in pneumatic liquid crystals. However, only very few under 10 were demonstrated so far. And so uh, the conventional pneumatic liquid crystal we use in this place, for example, has this uniaxial D infinity H symmetry. Um, and uh, already for 70 years or so, community uh, people, theorists in particular, were dreaming about uh, the 
optically biaxial pneumatic liquid crystals that would have D2H symmetry. However, they were extremely difficult to be found. Uh, and they were even called Higgs bosons of soft condensed matter. Um, however, uh, people were typically searching for them in systems that have the symmetry of the molecules or other building blocks like colloidal particles that match this D2H symmetry of the intended point group symmetry of the pneumatic phase. What was surprising was that we found such uh, biaxial or sarombic pneumatic fluid when we dispersed very thin nanorods in a conventional uniaxial pneumatic liquid crystal. And then surface boundary conditions, in addition to intercolloidal interactions, led to formation of not only uniaxial pneumatic states, but also biaxial liquid crystals. And so in this case, we can see that uh, the uh, there can be emergent behavior of the symmetry of the pneumatic fluid that is lower than that of the building blocks from which you make it. When these blocks have peculiar interactions with each other, in particular through the surface boundary conditions on the colloidal surfaces. And so now, however, today I will discuss with you what happens when we take very thin 10 nanometers or so in thickness uh, colloidal disks that you can see in here and disperse them in this pneumatic liquid crystal host. Uh, so they can be much smaller in diameter, but we specifically choose this lateral size so that we can see them very clearly optically and characterize their behavior. And so when uh, uh, we disperse them inside of pneumatic liquid crystal host medium, we can control surface boundary conditions, and these boundary conditions change as we vary temperature. So you can see from these images that with change in temperature, these disks very uh, slowly tilt to the left or to the right, and then as you change temperature by five degrees or so, they rotate by 90 degrees, going from initial orientation where large area faces were parallel to the pneumatic liquid crystal director of the host medium and then becoming perpendicular. In between, you have these tilted orientations. And so as these particles rotate because of the change of the boundary conditions on the surface, there is a corona of the formations of molecular alignment field around the periphery of this particle that is changing all the time. And you can see in here that we can understand it as a multipolar uh, deformation of director field. In this case, for this particular orientation, quadrupolar. And uh, this is how we can depict this elastic charge distribution around such a colloidal particle. So now we can um, disperse such particles uh, inside the pneumatic host, and they are designed to, to give us up-conversion-based luminescence when we excite them with 980 nanometers laser, right? Because these um, yttrium sodium fluoride nanoparticles that are doped in such a way that uh, you can have photon up-conversion when you excite them with this wavelength of light. And they're also electrostatically charged and we can watch in confocal or luminescence microscopy videos like this to probe the interactions. Because they are charged, we have competition between electrostatic repulsions and also nematostatic uh, anisotropic interactions. When we have many such nanoparticles, you can see in here, they all align edge on. And uh, because at this temperature, they want to be with their large area faces parallel to the far field molecular alignment. As we can see in this confocal and bright field imaging techniques. At these conditions, uh, the number of particles is still small. The density is small so that uh, the orientations of the normals to the uh, thin disks 
are all disordered and point in all different directions. However, this changes as we increase the concentration of these particles. And you can see that they quickly adopt a common orientation. And here they all edge on. Uh, uh, the molecular director is perpendicular to the screen. And then all the colloids point in the same horizontal direction with their normals to the surface. Right, uh, and this defines a colloidal director. In this image, all the colloids are face on, so the colloidal director is perpendicular to the screen and molecular director is in plane. This is a representation of such a nanocolloidal assembly that we have with the coronae of the formations of the molecular alignment field around these thin disks and three mutually orthogonal directors, molecular, colloidal, and the third one, which is perpendicular to both. So this type of system has orthorhombic symmetry, and this uh, also a fluid because both the molecules and the disks are free to move around each other with uninhibited fluidity. Because of this um, imaging that we do, we can characterize orientational distributions of such thin colloidal disks, and then here you can see polar and dithymusal angles uh, telling us that already at purely colloidal disk level we have biaxial orientational distribution. These are the videos showing uh, uh, such um, colloidal dispersions where you can see them freely moving one around each other in different orientations of molecular and colloidal directors while preserving orientational ordering. And so this is what we realize at uh, slightly above room temperature at uh, a concentration of the colloidal disk corresponding to this number density in here. But as we change temperature by a few degrees, we can see that these disks are starting to tilt uh, with respect to the molecular director. And so now the colloidal and molecular directors are at an oblique angle with respect to each other. You can see the deformations at the edges, and we can again use the confocal imaging technique to probe orientations because we can slice the sample in different orthogonal plane and, uh, planes and probe both uh, at the musal and polar angles. And we can see already at the colloidal level that we have this uh, uh, monoclinic symmetry of the orientational order. As we change temperature, uh, as you can see going here uh, from uh, slightly above room temperature to you know, 33 degrees or 34 degrees of Celsius, we can see that these orientational distributions shift. Um, and uh, uh, as they do, uh, the uh, particles um, have the tilt distributions um, uh, changing with temperature. Moreover, not only polar angles change, uh, also because of change of temperature, we see the change uh, of the width of the azimuthal angle distributions. And having all of these data, we can quantitatively characterize orientational order parameters. For a uniaxial pneumatic liquid crystal, you would have just one order parameter which would be changing uh, up to maximum value of one. Um, in here, we have three orientational order parameters. Uh, in addition to this S scale order parameter, we have biaxiality and monoclinicity. And I'll not go too much into detail of this uh, uh, deep liquid crystal physics, but uh, uh, we have now very quantitative characterization orientational order of the system. And the overall phase behavior of the system is extremely rich. All that we were looking at were some places of this part of the phase diagram at the front uh, plane in here, uh, where we were changing temperature and number density of the particles. But as we change the surface charge of these particles, uh, we can also realize uh, uh, spectic ordering. We can also realize different types of columnar assemblies uh, 
and you can see that the diagram is very rich, but really the uh, new discovery in terms of liquid crystal physics is uh, this monoclinic pneumatic liquid crystal phase, which uh, realizes monoclinic order without any lattice, right? Unlike in monoclinic solid crystals where you have uh, the symmetry of lattice um, coming into play. And here we have uninhibited fluidity and it's only orientational order of molecules along these pink lines and the disks, you know, with the orientations of the normals defining colloidal director uh, that these two different oblique directors uh, at an angle with respect to each other define the C2H point group symmetry of this uh, uh, phase with uh, only one pi rotation symmetry axis and one mirror symmetry plane. Uh, what is interesting is that we can change colloidal disk particles. We can take this barium hexafluoride plates, which are even smaller, coat them with silica and then we functionalize with PEG. And in this case too, we can control the orientations uh, from being parallel to perpendicular um, with respect to the far field liquid crystal director field as we change these boundary conditions. And so in this case, in addition to electrostatic monopoles and elastic multiples, we also have magnetic dipoles coming into play in terms of uh, interactions. And uh, uh, from the isotropic phase dispersion of the pneumatic host medium, we can quench it in presence of magnetic field and obtain such a, a ferromagnetic nanocolloidal dispersion. So just like the solid state analogs of uh, ferromagnets, and here we have magnetic hysteresis loops. You can see probing such loops um, for uh, uh, the magnetization being um, at an angle with respect to far field director and when two of them are parallel to each other. Uh, moreover, we also find all kinds of domain walls with very beautiful fundamental physics behavior. In the limit when molecular director is parallel to uh, the magnetization, which is defined by average orientation of magnetic dipole moments of these magnetically monodomain nanoplatelets, we have C infinity V fluid uh, which, by the way, um, was first theoretically considered by Max Born, uh, but never demonstrated before this time. What's very interesting for the next part of story that I will tell you is that in here we have different order parameters, right? So the, uh, when we have magnetization parallel to the um, far-field director, all the possible orientations that unit magnetization vector can take are on the surface of a unit sphere. And so S2 is the order parameter space. Uh, in the case of the far field magnetization and director being at an oblique angle, the order parameter space is S3, hypersphere mod Z2. Why is it interesting? Because um, in physics, we have so many beautiful types of solitons that come into theoretical considerations in different fields from particle physics to cosmology. And so one example are these uh, uh, Skirm-Witten solitons, which are elements of the third homotopy group of S3 spheres, um, where S3 in here is nothing else but SU2, right? These topological solitons are uh, the theoretical descriptors of uh, uh, subatomic nuclei with different baryon numbers, where Z uh, is nothing else but baryon number, right? And so uh, uh, now, uh, recently in physics, we are fascinated by baby analogs of these skirmions, right? Where they arise, for example, in magnets and in liquid crystals, they are elements of the second homotopy group of S2 spheres. 
Um, <clears throat> and you know, there are of course also all kinds of domain walls I was showing you, but there are also hopions uh, which have uh, the uh, hop vibration in the order parameter space. Uh, so they are uh, pi three third homotopy group element of S two spheres. And so these three two these two types of topological solitons is what I will focus on because they are three dimensionally localized particle like objects. And so the Derek uh, theorem would actually um, predict that such solitons should not be possible to be realized within uh, the linear theories. And in high energy physics, um, <coughs> SCIRM introduced nonlinear terms in the nonlinear sigma model in order to overcome constraints of that theorem. In condensed matter systems and magnets, we have Zeloshinsky Maria like terms, chiral terms in Hamiltonians, right, that allow us to stabilize, for example, two dimensional skirmians. In liquid crystals, uh, this is now a description of uh, free energy in terms of deformations of magnetization field M. We also have a chiral term when we add chiral molecules into uh, the uh, liquid crystal medium. And so these chiral molecules have such carbon centers um, that make um, the system adopt helic uh, twisted structures of different kind in terms of director and magnetization field. What's interesting is that in one constant approximation, when all of these constants are equal and you have these relations, these two different Hamiltonians can be one, mapped one onto another. And so uh, therefore what we find uh, in a certain limit in soft condensed metaphysics also is applicable to the solid state system too. So when we have a, um, a baby skirmion, right, which exists in R2 or two dimensional plane or can be a two dimensional translation invariant structure, you have all of these possible three dimensional orientations of the spin or magnetization vector that fully cover the order parameter space when you map from the 2D plane to S2. In three dimensions, we have um, something analogous. We define in here a concept of pre-image, which is a region in three-dimensional space where magnetization or spin point in the same direction. And for us to have the Hopfian or Hopf vibration and order parameter space, this for every single orientation on S2 sphere, the pre-images need to have the closed loop like topology and have to be linked with each other exactly the same number of times. Might sound like hard to imagine how this happens, but here is the structure that we obtain by numerically minimizing free energy. And uh, you can see it in here in a plane orthogonal to far field magnetization and then a plane containing it. When you look at the pre-images of every single point on S2, you can see them having closed loops like topology. And for every pair of pre-images, these closed loops are linked with, this, with respect to each other. So in all of these regions, the magnetic moments of the nanoparticles point in the exactly same direction corresponding to this point on the S2 sphere. We can now use nonlinear optical microscopy to map the patterns of molecular alignment field and magnetization field. Uh, <clears throat> and um, in this case, we use uh, the three photon absorption-based absorption -based, uh, polarized luminescence imaging in order to reconstruct field configurations. But first, we can predict the images, numerically simulate images that we expect to have for different polarizations of femtosecond laser light and different cross-sectional planes in three of these perpendicular to far field magnetization and in three of these containing it. When we do the actual me imaging, you can see that we obtain very close agreement in all of these images. Moreover, we can also reconstruct the pre-images themselves in the topological space. And so you can see 
that they agree, experiment and theory, not just up to topology, but also with all the geometric features being very similar to each other. So the, to, the topological soliton that we have has all the pre-images in the form of closed loops, and as you advance in here, the polar angle on the S2 order parameter space, for every constant polar angle, pre-images tile into tori, and tori nest in each other, filling in the space all the way until you get to the North Pole, which corresponds to the largest torus where uh, in the periphery of it, uh, you have uniform far-field background and all possible pre-images with all different orientations of order parameter within it. When we characterize the linking number based on the crossings, we see that it is always the same for all possible combinations. And now you can see this type of configuration where um, we have this nested tori um, filling in the three-dimensional space of the localized topological solitons. And this uh, order parameter orientation correspond to nothing else but magnetic moment orientations of other nanoplates. So the objects that we have seen in here um, are topological solitons, but we know that uh, the, <clears throat> uh, there can be an integer number of different variants of them. And indeed, in here, we have uh, another soliton with pre-images linked two times with each other, where uh, uh, the Hopf index is equal to two. This is because uh, this linking number, which is the topological invariant for such solitons, right, can be any integer, right, corresponding to z in here. And these different solitons with different linking number are as different as spheres and tori, for example, that have different genus or number of holes in the surface. We can now see in here the solitons with different Hopf index invariants and apply to the system an external magnetic field. Because the system has polar response, you can see that for parallel and Dayton parallel orientations of applied magnetic field with respect to far field magnetization, we have shrinking or expansion. And in here, this happens also for a crystalline lattice of such topological solitons which self-assembled in our sample. So uh, these solitons morph become bigger or smaller, but they don't go away because they are topologically protected, not like structures that you can see in here depicted in terms of topology of the linking of their pre-images. However, we can also apply an external electric field. And in here you can see in this movie how we can transform the geometric configuration of the soliton as we change the far field background and also the internal structure of the soliton. But in doing so, we do not change topology of this uh, configuration. It is more or less like morphing a donut into cup and back without changing the number of the hole in this case. From comparing this computer simulated polarizing optical microscopy images, pre-images and experimental polarizing microscopy images, you can see that we have very good agreement in our modeling and understanding of this system. Well, so up to now, I was telling you about the solitons that are hope solitons, right? Where all the parameter space is S2 sphere. However, when we have uh, uh, oblique orientation between the far field director and magnetization, or the parameter space is S3 mod Z2, and in this case, we can get the close analog of the uh, skirm witten topological solitons, because both for order parameter space S3 and S3 mod Z2, uh, we have the similar type of configurations that can be realized. So when we now uh, minimize free energy and look at different components of these fields, uh, <clears throat> We can see that in all of the components, we, can, we have linking of pre-images uh, in terms of um, orientation of these three 
mutually orthonormal fields. And in here you can see the details of the structure, which is mapped in molecular alignment field, magnetization field, and the field which is orthogonal to both of them in all different cross-sectional planes. So this, what you see, is nothing else but a topological analog of a nucleon, and we can have different baryon numbers. However, how do different baryon numbers in the nucleons come uh, about? Well, uh, <clears throat> in uh, high energy physics theories, they are realized by fusion of elementary topological solitons with baryon number one. Uh, so for example, in this paper, you can read it. But from this video in here, you can see how an analog of fusion happens in this condensed matter system, where uh, during the fusion, multiple elementary topological solitons come together and get a uh, uh, um, baryon number analog corresponding to the sum of them. With this, I would like to conclude. I hope uh, I was able to demonstrate to you that um, by designing pneumatic colloidal nanoparticles, we can realize the condensed matter phases that did not exist before, not just catching up with nature that already had all the different possible crystals um, uh, and uh, simply uh, mimicking what nature allowed to obtain. Uh, <clears throat> what was very unexpected, as you could see, was that the symmetry of the phase that we obtain could be lower than that of symmetry of the building blocks. Uh, and uh, many more pneumatic phases can be realized, um, <clears throat> I think, with this approach by designing nanoparticles and interactions between them. Uh, so uh, I also demonstrated to you hopions and three-dimensional skirmions um, that are analogs of um, <clears throat> topological solitons and different branches of science uh, from particle physics to cosmology. With this, I would like to conclude and thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Ivan, for a fascinating talk with a few questions. Hey, this is amazing. So uh, I, I'm curious, how do you excite these topological solitons? Do they naturally arise or you need to do something to excite them? A very good question. So indeed, under some conditions, they can uh, emerge naturally when we quench the system from uh, isotropic state to uh, liquid crystalline state because they correspond to minima of free energy. We can also uh, nucleate them locally by using a laser tweezer, melting liquid crystal, and then they nucleate locally as well, right? So there are different ways to do it. And they also self-assemble into these lattices. That's correct, yeah. yeah very interesting. More questions? So thank you very much for a beautiful talk. Um, in the case of the platelets in the pneumatic aligning field, uh, if I saw it right in your face diagram, there's a Smectic and which is surrounded by a pneumatic phase. Mm -hmm. Yes. What is the mechanism behind uh, it? It's, it's a very good question. So that smectic phase, actually, I have more things that I could not show because of lack of time. <laughs> uh, but let me go maybe to, uh, I believe I have a um, few more things. Yeah, so, so in here you can see such a smectic organization, right? And it happens um, at the temperature where uh, the disks are roughly at 45 degrees with respect to uh, the far field director, right? So at that time, the distortions on the periphery of the disk are the strongest because of the misalignment. And the elasticity mediated indirections are the strongest. And therefore, they tend to um, interact more attractively to form such layers, right? As um, you can see in here, I think there is a video, although it's not playing very continuously, but. Thanks. 
Mm. Okay, uh, thank you. It was very, <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, uh, do you know of any uh, liquid crystal analog of uh, Dirac's monopole, magnetic monopole? <laughs> um, I think I should realize one. <laughs> Yeah, very inspirational talk, thank you. Uh, so my question is, uh, did you uh, look at some behavior, for example, second order phase transition, uh, for example, from isotropic to pneumatic or some, and basically trying to see if there is any uh, reflection of the fluctuations, the behavior of the, of the objects, and that's, yeah, I could, I could imagine one can find some other analogy of this behavior with. Yeah, you're absolutely correct. There is a lot of fascinating behavior uh, I think there is a lot to study um, in, in these types of systems. So, for example, when you go from um, uniaxial pneumatic to biaxial, by increasing the density, you do have coexistence range in there as well, right? So, um, yeah, so this is something to study for sure. But currently we just have, you know, that diagram mapped, you know, um, more needs to be studied. Oh, wonderful talk. Um, so uh, two questions, uh, if I might. Uh, one is you have these two types of, multiple types of order together. Um, do you have a way of controlling anchoring onto boundaries independently for the different types of order? And my other question is have you, um, can you, inflate the core of a Hopfion and pass one through another? Uh, yeah, a very good question. Both very good questions. So, uh, uh, yes, um, we can define the boundary conditions, for example, on confining surfaces, right? For molecular director, very easy, it's standard techniques, you know, that people developed, say, for liquid crystal display industry and we can use, right? For the um, Magnetic uh, order, for example, we, what we did in the past was um, we dispersed um, uh, magnetic nanoplates in the, um, uh, you know, um, resin and, and coated it uh, in presence of magnetic field. And then um, when we cured and we filled in such a dispersion, we could define the um, boundary conditions for the magnetization as well. However, of course, um, there are some limitations so far in terms of what types of boundary conditions can be imposed. Um, so let's see, and in terms of the, the hopions, so um, you know that we can have also nested hopions, right? Because, um, um, you know, in the middle of a hopion, right, the, um, um, director is the same or magnetization is the same as in the far field background. So you can open it, right, and you can nest multiple hopions. This is yet another way you can get uh, the high charge or high hop index hopion. And in fact, we have a manuscript in preparation along some of these, uh, along these lines. Really cool. For one more question, I'll ask one. <laughs> um, actually, about this phase diagram. So, if you so you mentioned, so that's the surface charge on the right. Yes. So you, you develop a columnar phase. Oh uh, yes. So in here we have. Uh, so density. I should show you, right? So this is columnar pneumatic, okay. and there is also columnar rhombic phases. So the positional ordering in this case is two-dimensional. In this. Uh, which is, uh, um, yeah, uh, in this case there is no positional ordering because, the, you know, the columns are in column pneumatic phase, right? But it's also orthorhombic. Do you understand how, so how, the, how the surface charge leads to that phase? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We understand very well. So when you reduce the surface charge, they repel less in this medium so elastic interactions can bring the plates closer. 
right, because of attractive interactions and some orientations. And then they associate each other. You can see in here pairs, you know, forming dimers, but at a distance, dimers at a distance, right? And then when you have many plates, they form uh, these longer columns, right? But uh, uh, in, in, when you also change the uh, density, then, you know, they too decrystallize, where the columns are still free to move along the columnar directions, uh, the disks, but uh, uh, in 2D, perpendicular to columns, it's a 2D crystal. All right. So you have in here 1D fluidity, 2D positional order. In the case of smectic phase, you have 1D um, quasi-long-range positional order and 2D fluidity. Thank you. Let's thank Ivan again for a wonderful talk.